So my name is Martin Higgins and standing here on my island in a skiing island in the middle of Loch McNean. My father, I gave me this island after he passed away. Our ancestors, this is where they lived back in the early 1800s and they were self-sufficient so they were. They grew their crops of corn, potatoes, they had a pig, they had the poultry, geese, ducks, everything. Just as a normal family in the, in the 1800s, you know. Used the island just as, as it always was for cattle and sheep. So now we've got a steel barge, we call it a cot. But prior to that we used to swim them on. Swam them off, swam them on, that was the way it was done because there was no, there was no other way of doing it, you know. We walked them up the road, all the cattle, there used to be maybe 14 of them. And then there'd be maybe three men with long hazel rods beating them out into the water. And once they get into the water, they'd just go straight across, you know, swim on, no bother. Because they knew, they knew where they were going. There was one story of where my father one time sold cattle from here at a fair in Manor Hamilton. And the story was, and it's true, that he, he sold them and came home that night with his money and, and, and went, went up to the house. But when he came back to the island in the morning, the cattle had broke, broke away from the fair, from the man that bought them, ran the whole way back, 12 or 13 mile, jumped the wall down here at Keelaport, we call it, and swam back into the island. That is the truth. The leg, the leg been in here, you know. This was the better grass, better quality grass in here than over there, you know. I do like this thing of going down here, you know, to the men's shed. It helps to make a day for me, you know. Yeah, I grew up, uh, yeah, just about a mile and a half from here in Black Lane. And uh, I went to school, uh, to uh, a local school and to the Brothers in Inniskillen Secondary School. You know, when we were young fellas, we'd go out and hunt the rabbits and we'd sell them then. There'd be a shilling and two and six. <laughs> That's old money. Well, we'd have uh, dogs, you know, and uh, the dogs said uh, we'd be out to land and mush, uh, bushy land, you know, where there'd be bushes growing, and the dog would scent a rabbit and it'd take off and it'd go into the ditch. So then we'd hook down the ditch and put our hand in and pull out the rabbit and then give it the rabbit punch <laughs> to kill it, you know, back of the head. So that we'd have them stacked there and then collect them and sell them in a couple of days after they'll be sold. So it was a great it was a great income. And we put nets over the holes, over the burrows, maybe four or five nets, and put it in the forest, with the forest. And she, the rabbits would come all out onto the nets. Like, that's her pocket money. Like we would be wise now to get four or five, <laughs> you know, to be a like, great achievement. Now today we'll come home with any. <laughs> I maybe lost a ferret as well. <laughs> then uh, maximatosis came down, which killed them all. Uh, hardly ever any rabbits appeared since the maximatosis. It's uh, brought a big change, you know, to see them all missing off the ground. Yes, I'm David Fawcett, and uh, this land originally belonged to my great-aunt Annie. In 1963, I moved with my mother up to this site. And we built the house on this site, which is known as the Gob. And uh, previously, this field here was used for growing potatoes and oats. I wasn't a, a modernising farmer. That meant that they just farmed in the traditional fashion. We're back now, I'm talking about 40, 50 years ago. There were no tractors. We had a, a horse and a cart and a, 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 what they call a shifter. <laughs> that is for ticket. It's a flat bottomed cart, no sides or nothing. And it tipped up and you pulled your rook of hay or straw up on that and took it on to the barn. There was no tractors. See, see, long ago, the, 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 the people with four or five cows, they could manage with a, a pony or a, 
a, a small small tractor or but now if you're going to make money of farm you need the big machinery and then you need the big, lot of land and you need the, the grass growing that's see it's all machine work now but that time it was all manual manual labor and that was it certainly the agriculture has changed significantly in the last 30 years there's a lot more mechanization and I suppose in my childhood there would have been a lot more hands-on farm hands and there would have been pitchforks, slash hooks and things like that, whereas now it's hedge cutters and sort of 20 minutes with a, a track machine and shears will undo 40 years of growth. But then the, 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 the biggest problem with the farming is, is the slurry then, getting rid of the slurry, you see, and you're putting it out in the land and where else can you put it? And it's causing a lot of pollu it's pollution, like in rivers and everything else, no matter what you do. But there's no way around it, like, you, you have to get rid of it. Well, I'm not, no lover of slurry. I never applied any slurry to the ground. But to me, a, a big application of slurry on a field left the field very tender. Mm -hmm. Well, there's no doubt about it that you get a lot of dead worms after an application of slurry. Yeah. The slurry regulations are absolutely mad. You know, yeah, but obviously distancing from streams and such, but we live in Fermanagh. You know, it's uh, wet at the best of times and the guys need to be able to put it out, you know, when they can put it out, you know, when it's possible to put it on the ground. I'm led to believe government policy that it's um, farmers are being penalised on their single farm payments because such and such a hedge is encroaching onto grassland and you know those hedges there were so many species dependent on them for nest and cover for food they were just more aesthetically pleasing you know you can't condemn the, the local farmers because without them we'd have nothing at all. But I used to work on forestry. I done all jobs, I done planting, tree surgery, and research on it, research and fertilizing different types of trees and different types of ground. And well, my favorite trees it would be the hardwood trees, the, the oak and the beech. It's the silky spruce has, has taken over all the, the areas that the forestry planted. That's for the use of timber for roofing and fence posts and stuff like that. You don't usually get squirrels and, and other wild life in the, in the forest, in the silky spruce. Whereas if you had hardwoods, you'd have more squirrels and, and, and boards like that, you know. The, the ash is dying now, it's diseased here in our country and it's a pity to see it. Hurley sticks was made from ash and it's the only timber that uh, was suitable for the hurling because um, it's pliable and it uh, doesn't break. So they have trouble now getting the ash trees and they're trying to grow them now. The people uh, mostly in the south of Ireland are the Horland people. They have tried all different uh, types of stuff, plastic hurlers and all, hurlies and all like that. They have, none of them are satisfactory. So it's back to the natural ash now. And then there was the alum tree. It, it, is, it has disappeared too because it took something too that it, they all did. Would have fished a lot in the early childhood, from I suppose about five or six on. One of the biggest pike I ever caught in Lower McNeen, I think it was about 37 pound three ounces or something like that, and I caught it when I was quite young. It was huge. It was almost the same length as myself. So I don't know, it wasn't very skillful. It was more or less just grab the fishing rod and run up the field. <laughs> Whatever was behind it was coming, sliding behind me. So. But we have amazing potential for a core shore game fishery. There's some excellent trout fishing in both lakes. When I started fishing, it was all worm fishing. You just get a hook and a line and put the worm on the hook, throw it into the water. And that's it, the fish takes it. Uh, I do a lot of fishing, uh, fly fishing, Most, mostly fly fishing, yeah. trout. All the time throughout. They're not as easy caught as they used to be. 
no, definitely not. The Arley River, like when I fished it when I was young, was full of fish. Yeah, you couldn't go wrong. Full of co there really would be a lot of coarse fish in it yet, but the trout are definitely deteriorated. In it. There was no insects for a start anyway. The insects are all gone. Years ago, if you drove around that lake or down up and down the road, close to the lake, your windscreen was just covered with flies. You would you'd have to get out and clean it. Now, there's no flies on the windscreen. There's a great hatch of mayfly, but there's not, uh, there's not a lot of trout taking them down that, on Lower McNean or on the Arnie River. Oh, there's lots of stuff on McNean. Wildlife boards and that. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's be the kingfisher and there's uh, on some of the lakes they and he a woodpecker. The swans was nice. Swans are nice there in the lake. The the helping area in appearance as well, you know. The curlew was down on the lake shore here, and it was common enough, and also snipe. But the, the call the call of the curlew was quite distinctive. And that's one thing that you miss nowadays. The curlew seems to have disappeared from this area. There are no curlews nesting, mm -hmm. or very few, through loss of habitat. The birds are being forced into smaller areas for nesting cover, and uh, the predators know that. Grey crows know that, magpies know it, and mink will know it, and foxes will know it. Um, they'll centre in on those areas, you know. I'm just wor generally worried about the, the loss of habitat in the area, nesting cover for birds especially. Just not got the, the habitat there, the nesting habitat. It used to be there and the species are declining. And also, I suppose, the seeds of the, of the later flowering provided more food for the, the young birds who were growing up. The corn creek's gone completely from around this area. And the cuckoo's getting scarce. And I don't think there's as many swallows as there was. You know, we maybe see 30 or 40. They're down to bunches, three or four now. You, you tenders your mowing season too, allow the birds to escape. So if you spent the day mowing a meadow, you left it at lunchtime, and then in that time the corn crakes had mostly dispersed. But uh, you spent some time clearing the the field of the wild birds. It's funny, the, uh, the corn crakes were the most difficult because they didn't like leaving the shelter of the, the grass. And they had these little black birds running all over the place. But now the corn crakes have virtually disappeared. I mean, when I was growing up and started off, you would have a lot of corn crakes in a, in a field. You waited until the first week or second week in July. Okay. And then most of the, most of the wild birds had disappeared at that stage. Okay. The other bird that used to be a nuisance in the meadows were pheasants because the pheasant would sit on, on her eggs or sit on a nest until the moor is practically on top of her. Oh, you, you, you just pulled, pulled the moor out and you started to mow in a different, a different area. And there's the thing that's disappeared as well, is the bees' nests in the meadows, especially the red bee. The red bee used to build in the fog, mm -hmm. but then you have no moss, you have no moss in meadows, no, so there's nothing to build their nests in, because the ground's too rank, it's, it's, it's all grass just. My name is Eddie Brogan, and we are in Arnie, County Fermanagh. This here is Arnie Forge, 
a forger knocked up some years ago just to get another chimney smoking in the village again. And it's a full working forge. And there's all kinds of old tools here. No electric, everything is old, natural. Wooden cupboards, oil lamps, candles, and all kinds of old equipment. And I think what we're here to talk about today is a device was invented next door here by a man called Q Keenan. This was a row of villages here, a lot of mouths to feed on the banks of the Arnie River. A very good river full of fish, prime salmon, prime trout. But the gentry in the area up in the big house in Florence Court, not only did he reckon he owned the river, but he owned the fish in the river. So, while the locals fished then, it was poaching. They went out at night with a sally rod, a cane, and a cloth tied on the end of it. And you went out at night with the sally rod, with your friend with a gaff, this is the gaff, and you lit the oily rag, and you held it out over the river, over a deep spot, what they call the salmon hole, or trout hole. And the fish are like moths to a candle. They will follow the light in from the river in. And you can get them right into the bank in the dark of night. And then whenever you have your fish at the edge of the bank, right, go for them and you take your fish out under the chin and gaff it. Now then, but there's a problem with this method. The light at night could be seen for a mile. And his lordship had the bailiffs on the river. And God help you if you're caught stealing his fish out of his river. So this was a problem. As I said, a lot of mouths to feed here. Had to happen. So Q Keenan went to work. And Q Keenan came up with this device here. Which was a device for going to the river at night. Without the light being seen. Q invented this article here. A receptacle with a light tube and a lens on it. You lit the candle, dropped it into here. That light went down the lens. You then went to the river. And as you enter that into the water level, your light now is below the water level, like so, but the candle is above it. And in the dead of night, the fish will see the light, come to investigate the light, and that's when your mate would go, got you. And you'd have a fish without the light being seen. You know, you'd they sort of sit down on a nice evening and just stay completely quiet. Um, you'll see, you'll see plenty. There's room for everything on this planet if, if, if they're just let increase and multiply. Mm -hmm. 